Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I've just been thoroughly enjoying listening to my colleagues and all of you speak about your thoughts and your experiences. I mean, some of the experiences have been heartbreaking. I'm also feeling encouraged by some of the things that people have said about what their institutions are doing or what they would recommend that they do. And so what I wanna do is to throw some thoughts into that mix um, and to give some, share some ideas of what some universities are doing, what, other what we possibly could be doing. I do wanna note that I'm gonna be focusing on US institutions at this time because this is where I work. Um, I am Canadian, though, by citizenship and spent a big part of my career in uh, Canada and now have been in the States for almost a quarter of a century. So I've had some interesting reflections about being in two different countries. The other thing I wanted to note, is, and I'm going to weave through my points, the points that I wanted to make, because you, in many cases, many of you have already made those points. So I want to make sure we do appropriate acknowledgement of that. Just a wee bit more about me. I've been doing work in workplace bullying for the last quarter century, and it's been the last 13 years that I decided, why don't I focus on my own workplace, which is academia? And so I've done that in partnership with a colleague of mine, Joel Newman, who was at SUNY New Paltz, with Clara Weingart at Queensborough Community College in New York, and several other colleagues as well. It's, it's about time that we consider our own environment. And so I'm really grateful because I get this opportunity to also hear from you about your environment about the kinds of strategies that are and are not being used. So let's get started. What I wanna talk about is the culture of academic institutions and the culture of academia. Because the issue is that behavior never speaks for itself. It takes on meaning in a context. And for me, the academic setting is a fascinating context from the perspective of somebody who does work in workplace bullying across, studying that across contexts. The university and academia is a very unique structure. And I think in many ways, it opens up our eyes to things that we wouldn't think about in other organizations. So I'd like to do that. And then I want to give some examples. Now, these are just examples of actions. What I want to be clear about is you never just do one, that it's going to be important to engage in a variety of actions and whenever possible to have that be coordinated. So and I'll talk about the institutional level. Um, some examplars from the department or unit level and a strategy from at the individual level. And then I want to touch lightly on what's coming up on the horizon and finish up with the idea about the power of prevention, because as what we can hear in some folks' voices as they share their stories, as I've talked to people who've had these experiences, you really never want to have to have somebody be that become a target because it, it's devastating. And if we can do things that will facilitate an environment that is more inclusive, respectful, and still characterized by vibrant, passionate debate and critique done constructively, then we're in a much stronger position. And I really appreciate Jennifer using the phrase rules of engagement, because I've used that in my writing of late, talking about how the context shapes the kinds of rules of engagement. So what universities are fascinating to me because of their missions, which is very different than a lot of other missions in corporate, uh, corporate America in this case. They also have very unique set of workers. So you have faculty who are a particularly unique set of workers, and you'll see some of the reasons why in this list. You have staff, and that's a huge group that's heterogeneous, covers a lot of different areas. And then you also have administrators. So these groups all have somewhat different roles within the institution and different sorts of values that underlie what they do. So that was going to shape what people see as acceptable or unacceptable behavior. It's also going to shape how we decide to respond to that behavior. So I'll keep reiterating that point as we go. But just to hit on the high points of academia, debate, critique, and dissent. For faculty, and as we're training our graduate students or educating our graduate students and our postdocs, this is how we polish our ideas, how we develop them, how we work to do a number of other lead to ideas of progress in the work that we do. Faculty need to recognize that the rules of debate, critique, and dissent are not necessarily ones that characterize what, say, for example, support staff do in an institution, where their roles tend to be more cooperative. So we do, though, want to have that kind of environment 
because that's how science pushes forward. That's how challenge happens. We don't want to do it in the way that Mark Morteza talked about for Einstein or for any of the rest of you, where people mob and try to silence as opposed to moving forward. But de debate, critique, and dissent. Tenure or permanent contract. Now, that's only true for some faculty. For example, in the United States, almost three quarters of the faculty associated with institutions of higher education do not have a permanent contract or tenure. Academic freedom. There is so much we could say about academic freedom. In essence, for me, what academic freedom means is that faculty, academics, can pursue ideas, develop research, a scholarship, creative activity, even if it's controversial or unpopular. Again, for us, institutions and universities need to be places where there can be vibrant ideas developed, where we can challenge status quo, as Einstein did, as Galileo did, as a number of other people have done in science. We need to be able to do that. And so for faculty, that gives them a certain range of behaviors or behavioral domain within which to work that may not be true for staff or for administrators. Faculty, again, usually the ones who are tenured or with permanent contract, operate with a fair amount of autonomy, and that's a very close association to academic freedom being able to pursue the research and creative activity agendas in order to push forward on science. Faculty also have a unique role in the institution relative to other staff. And their unique role in the institution is through the notion of shared governance, which when it's operating in an institution, which doesn't mean it always does, okay? And many of you from institutions will probably be going, uh, yeah, that doesn't happen here, is when the Academics, faculty, and the administrators or management are supposed to be partners in the process of managing, moving forward the mission, the educational research mission of it, so that faculty are to be equal partners and to be involved in that decision making. That's different than what a lot of other staff have at the university. Within faculty, it's a community of scholars and the notion of peer review. And I'm gonna come back to peer review because I think there's something we can leverage there in terms of addressing bullying and mobbing. We've heard people reference the rank hierarchy amongst academics, but also within the institution itself. So there is a lot, and I'll talk a little bit about positional bullying. And then I've just been referencing that there is a distinction between faculty academic staff and all the other staff. And one of the things that people don't often talk much about, but I think we really need to talk about is uh, the notion of role within the institution. So beyond some of those ones that I just talked about, the University of California did a whole system-wide climate study back in 2014. Sue Rankin's group did that. And the most frequent reason people gave for being bullied or mistreated or intimidated had to do with their role in the university. So there is an association with certain employee groups or member groups, but there's also an association with where you exist in the organizational hierarchy. And I just recently read an article and shared it with the staff in my own college about the level of distrust between faculty and other staff, that staff often feel, and often rightly so, that they are ignored or their voices are not taken into consideration. The challenge then with the, having these different employee groups and having somewhat different cultures associated with that is how do you design frameworks and policies policies that recognize the differences in those contexts um, so that you can address inappropriate behavior and that you can work to prevent it. I think it's really powerful for faculty to think about this and to, and to talk about the norms of their behaviors and to recognize that they are in organizations where other people who work there do not necessarily have the same kind of norms. So debate, critique, and dissent, right? I could say to my I could say to my chair or my dean, I can say, you know, I think that idea you just put forward is ridiculous and here's why. Now, I'm not sure I'd use the word ridiculous, but I'd always tell them why. And I'm not going to be worried about retaliation or I don't, I haven't been retaliated against yet for it. Now that can happen, but I wouldn't. But to ask one of our staff to say something to our dean about like that, or to say it to their supervisor, they're like, no, 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 that's insubordination. So that's just a, a small example about the differences when you have these different kinds of employee roles. So that when we're working with other people, we need to be cognizant and aware of the relational context that we're in with them. So faculty may be able to push back and forth against each other. 
number, but they need to recognize doing that with staff and doing that with students takes on a whole, can take on a whole other meaning. So we, we have responsibility as faculty to be sensitive to that. Tap on this. Leah made reference to this. Jennifer talked about this. It showed up in your comments at all. In essence, bullying is inherently positional. It's about power. So whether that's relative institutional power, whether it's professorial rank or tenure, whether it's power that comes from academic capital, and the university agenda. And by that, I mean some faculty will be provided greater idiosyncrasy credits for their behavior. If they're big grant getters, if they're pushing the university forward in an agenda that the university wants, they're more, more often held to different standards than others. Social identity, the data is just very, very strong about vulnerability. Women, ra those who are racial and ethnic minorities within an institution, persons with disability, uh, different socioeconomic class, those folks are more likely to experience bu bullying. And the interesting part is tenure, rank, and institutional position do not protect those, protect folks who are in those um, more vulnerable categories. So full professors who are women are not will not be as protected from bullying as perhaps full professors who are men. The other thing is to recognize the sources of power that the institution brings to bear and how these sources or these mechanisms can be ways in which the institution itself can engage in bullying. What Pramila de Cruz uh, and Ernesto Naranja refer to as depersonalized bullying. So subjective evaluation procedures. Why is that? Why is that a problem? Because other kinds of judgments can come in. So we may be doing a tenure and promotion assessment or a graduate student annual review. And if we don't have very clear criteria or rubrics, remember how we use those in our courses so that people know what criteria are going to be applied, then other kinds of things can creep in, like bias. Like, I don't like that person, so I don't want them to stay around. In the States, we're seeing a lot of politicization of funding agendas uh, and as well as donor influence. So to the extent that universities rely a great deal on fundraising to provide support, and in the States, we've seen increasingly decreased investment by state governments and also the federal governments in higher education. So that means the rise of the influence of the donor and their perspectives and their, uh, their views on what faculty can do and what students can do. Now that violates academic freedom, we know that, but there's also, the institution doesn't always move to protect on that. Universities are becoming more corporate marketization and corporatization. I'm using all sorts of multi-syllable words here today. And that, that's the emphasis then on efficiency and effectiveness. And that's not a set of criteria that's typically been part of education, the development of pedagogy, or about research and creative activity. The other thing is that people who are critical of the institution are more likely to be at risk of being bullied. So the ones who speak truth to power, who challenge some of the dominant narratives about who gets to make decisions, sometimes will be exposed to or, or mistreated. And then the other way an institution can drop the ball on all this is with faculty being public intellectuals and social media allowing more information about faculty to be out and faculty to be sharing their experiences and their agendas, there has been a huge backlash from the public in terms of cyber harassment. And what are universities doing in response to that critique? And sadly, some of them are not sticking up for campus members. So context matters. That's going to influence. So we can't just wholesale take things out of a corporate environment, the policies, the practices, the actions, and move them into an academic environment. We need to make sure that we take into account the nature of our context. And so I'll talk about these three at three different levels. Again, what I want to emphasize here, variety and coordination of actions is key. You don't just do one thing. You need to do a number of different actions hitting at each of the different levels and have that to whatever extent we can get it coordinated so that they actually work in concert with each other and support each other. Now that also requires a very high level of people understanding in the institution that bullying is a problem. It's a reflection of uh, a, a toxic environment um, and that it actually works against, as Morteza has written at some length, how it undermines science, as Leah pointed out as well, it actually uh, undermines the whole point, uh, 
undermines the success of university institutions in the long run. So at the institutional level, number one, I think what's really important in your institutions is you understand your own profile. You know, we can tell you from across a variety of universities, these are the issues. You need to find out what they look like in your own institution and then use that data to inform and to drive your actions. Many of you will probably have done climate surveys. We recently completed one uh, two or three years ago, our very first in our hundred and over 150 year history, our first one. And now we actually have data that surfaces some of these issues. And we did ask about bullying and we learned a lot about that. So it's important that you, your institution, understand its own profile, gather its data, and then use that to analyze and see what's going on. That data also can't just be held or kept amongst just a few at the institution. That data needs to be shared and discussed with the institutional community, showing people the data and saying, okay, so this is what it looks like. What does that mean to you? Why do you think that is, right? Each of us in our own places in the institution, hopefully we all know, we only have this big a perspective, but the institution is this big. And we need to know from different positions in the institution, different employee groups, all of that kind of thing. We need to know what that data looks like to people. Because again, just like behavior, data never speaks for itself. It happens in a context. We have had some really powerful discussions when we put things up in a visual display, a nice bar chart. And then we said to people, what does this mean to you? What do you think it looks like? And they've come up with interpretations that those of us who had designed the survey and done the data analysis had never thought of, right? So it's that important part about providing lots of opportunities to share with people. I think what's really important too in this process is the process itself that this is a collaborative process, that people are engaged across the institution, different levels, different groups, all over on an ongoing basis, that they have input, that there is discussion, that they can see the influence they have, because what you're doing in that process is modeling how you want to be as a community. And if what you have is a top-down or just from a specific group, and then the data goes away, and maybe they share it with you the feedback, but then you never hear any action, that is so discouraging for the people in an institution. And it has them further withdraw and to have questions about the environment. Use that data then to guide areas of key action. So for example, out of our climate survey, among many things we came up with, the stuff on bullying, we found relatively high rates of experiences of bullying for our faculty, for our staff, primarily. Our students had, had some, but it was our faculty and, and a lot of our staff who reported bullying. Um, and that actually galvanized people within the institution because it was solid data. So our academic senate, which represents our faculty and academic staff, called for an anti-bullying policy. So we now have a task force that is working on that. So that data shared with everybody, discussed with people and having meaningful, visible and consistent, persistent action coming out of it. We've all probably had the experience of one action coming and then nothing else happens. That again is really discouraging. It also contributes to an environment that's more likely to be supportive of this. I just wanna give you some examples throughout the presentation of what some universities are doing. University of Minnesota, their Student Conflict Resolution Center. This is an example about data-driven decision-making, what they learned from their climates uh, survey and how they responded to it. University of Massachusetts Amherst, has done a phenomenal job in terms of taking the data that they've got and using it to work with the community, to inform their policies and practices, and to engage in a wide variety of training and education and grievance procedures. Human resources in their case is heavily involved with this. So let me just do a quick poll with you. Does your current institution have a policy that focuses on bullying? So um, yeah, it's a good thing we redid this poll, right? Because what we see now is by far the majority of you indicate your institutions don't have a policy. Some of you aren't sure that you have one. And, and about 20% of you who are present with us today do have policies. So that's going to be an interesting discussion for us to share about. So let me hit some highlights on policies. Let me also say, we have a panel that will start at one o'clock. And it will be about policies and approaches from three different universities here in the States. So they're going to go through much more detail. Um, and talk to you about their experiences on their campus developing it. So again, you're gonna see how context matters, 
what issues they were choosing to address and how they've gone about doing it. So I'm just gonna keep at the 30,000 foot level for you um, and we'll go from there. I wanna say that policies are necessary, but they're not sufficient. So we've heard the theme throughout so far. We need policies. My Dean will often say that to me. We're like, I, have, I need to deal with this behavior, but I don't have a policy for it. So why do we need policies? Because they, they codify and communicate what are our desired practices? What are our conduct practices going to be? They give us a framework for solving problematic circumstances and managing, mitigating risk. They're grounded in a university's mission, vision, and shared values, including academic freedom and freedom of expression. So this is where I think we get some really exciting insight watching what universities try to do because of the norms of uh, academic freedom in particular that other other organizations do not have. If we don't have it, then we see a couple, at least a couple of things happen. One is incidents tend to be assessed in, in isolation and seen as subjective. That's a personality conflict. That's just between you two, but doesn't consider that there might be systemic or structural patterns. For example, if we have a number of issues coming out of a unit, that should be a red flag. And HR will often track that kind of thing. The other thing is inconsistent responding. So one part of the, you might have one department in college that does a phenomenal job about responding and being clear and transparent with timelines, processes, the whole thing. And then you might have another part of the institution that doesn't do that. And that kind of inconsistency of responding is deeply problematic. You know, whenever we design something, we should be thinking about what is it that we're trying to accomplish? What do we want to have? So we want to stop this stuff in the earlier presentations and in discussion about making the victim whole. How do we consider restoration? And I'll talk briefly about that. Protect academic freedom and freedom of expression. Preserve highest standards of teaching and scholarship. That's who we are as institutions. And that's sometimes what marketization and corporatization sometimes challenges us on. We need to advance it. We need to support constructive debate, dissent, and critique. That is our discourse. That is how we, how we develop our ideas, how we push forward our science. We need to help facilitate the expression of all voices so that people aren't gonna feel silenced depending on where they come from in the institution or whatever their identity is. And our policy also needs to support and be an, an environment that is vibrant, that is just, that is inclusive, facilitating engagement, work and learning. So actually what you're going to hear in those words are probably very similar words that you hear when we have discussions about social justice and diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Those themes are connected directly to bullying. As I talked about different vulnerabilities, if we have campuses that have inclusive, genuinely inclusive climates, where people do feel they belong and do feel their voices are heard and are sought out and asked for feedback, that is an environment that is antithetical to bullying. Easy to achieve? No, but it, it is possible. These are just some examples of uh, universities that currently have policies in place. I just wanted to give you a quick visual like, oh, this is great. This is just scratching the surface, right? This is Okay, there's more. And I just learned about uh, Virginia Tech and their focus with graduate students. That's gonna get added into it as well. I think it's useful just to think about a process by how you would go about looking at a policy and how you go about developing it. Number one, develop it collaboratively with everybody. You can't have it come from one place in the institution. It needs to be developed collaboratively over time. It has to tie to the core mission. You need to articulate relationships to other policies. Uh, Leo was, you know, we were talking about civil rights policy in the states, Title IX, Title VII. Many of you what might have workplace violence policies. They may not include bullying, but you know, sexual harassment policies, discrimination policies. You have to show how those might connect. And in some cases, some universities have put them together under one policy. What this stuff is, and we also heard in people's discussions, a very clear strongly worded statement about the institutional view and commitment to this. Why bullying is a problem, what it does, how it attacks, what a university should be and what the environment should be, and what is the commitment throughout the institution, particularly from senior administration. It requires reporting vol incidents. I'm gonna hit that in just a moment. I wanted to highlight this next part, referral to procedures or systems about how to deal with it. We heard a lot of conversation here about ombuds. And I wanna give a shout out to the ombuds because in my experience working in bullying and academia in the States, for me, it was the ombuds in higher education institutions 
who first flagged this as a really serious issue in the states because they were getting concerns being expressed to them and start so then they started talking more about it and so you you saw Shannon Lynn Burton, who's the editor of the Journal of the International Ombuds Association. They've had several issues on this. Leah's written for them. I've written for them. So have a number of other people. But more broadly, one of the things, for example, we learned from our climate survey was that the majority of people who responded, and we had a great response rate, the majority of people who responded did not know where to take something when they had a hostile, unfair discriminatory experience on campus. Over half the people didn't know. And we looked at that and went, but there are all these offices. We have an ombuds, we have OEO, we have Title IX, we have the President's Office, the Provost's Office, the Dean's Offices, all that stuff. We had that, but people didn't know about it. And I know someone in the discussion made that point repeatedly when they talked about graduate students and saying graduate students don't seem to know that there are other options. It's not just graduate students who don't know. It's often an entire campus is not clear. So elevating these different offices, articulating what issues that they are they handle or that you report to, um, giving information about flow because I know some a lot of things go to OEO offices, but it's not it doesn't fall under an OEO mandate. So where does it go from there? Being able to articulate and raise it, if we can raise that level, make it visible what's possible and where you could take things, that will go quite a distance. And then you need to be able to articulate what are the roles and responsibilities of different stakeholders and having a senior person or persons responsible for monitoring and auditing. None of this will be a surprise for any of you. And that's why I say policies can't be the only thing because they rely on reporting. And yet there are so many barriers to people reporting formally. And these are just a list of some of them. And I'm sure you could generate a whole lot more right? So can't just have policies. You need them for a framework. You need people to know about them, but you also have to be very conscious about the fact that there are going to be these limitations on people bringing things forward. Some, one of the reasons people often don't is because they don't think it has risen to the level of being serious enough. And what we know from bullying, as Leah pointed out, is it's an escalating process. So it starts out often fairly covert, just the occasional thing. So somebody hasn't identified it as bullying yet, but they may have identified that this is an uncomfortable situation or I wanna be able to talk about this. So we heard somebody else, David Michael mentioned that some of the actions that are possible might be at that early level or what Charlotte Rayner calls the not yet bullied is an opportunity for a co constructive conversation that could potentially be facilitated by an ombuds, by somebody else within the organization. So we have to deal with issues of reporting, but we clearly need other kinds of approaches. Institutionally too, the data is really strong. And I, I mentioned if you look across um, a lot of different um, institutions, if you have an environment that is very stressful and they're what we call the role state stressors, overload, too much work, unclear guidelines or conflicting roles, that increases people's experience of stress and stressful competitive environments have higher rates of bullying. So how an institution can therefore look at that and look to see if there are ways that they can help work and manage the role state stressors. Reward structures, only, there's only a few official awards, but there's a lot of really competent and qualified people for them. How do we handle acknowledgement? Do we infuse it throughout our entire culture? Clarifying our procedures and indicators. So I mentioned the subjective performance measures. Um, it's been interesting for me to look at the TMP policies of our different colleges within my own campus and how some of them have worked to be extremely clear about what's required to get through tenure and promotion. Because that's one of the things we hear the most often from faculty who are on tenure tracks is it's not clear to me what I have to do in order to accomplish. Mentoring and support resources. And Leah talked about that in response to questions about MOOC. And then also addressing donor pressures. And this is one where universities are really struggling. Now I've put my own institution up here because our climate survey, but also this past year with the pandemic and the George Floyd murders and the social justice energy that rose up around that, which has always been there, but became much more visible and more engaged by more people, I should say. So we actually set up a social justice action committee and 
part of their task was reviewing all of the reward structures, all of this, uh, the performance measures for faculty and staff to look for bias and to work to change that, to make things much more clearer, more specific, a visible, transparent, and so forth. And then we also just received an NSF advance grant, which is typically focused on women, faculty, and STEM. And that part of that grant is we're doing an we're examining the work environment for faculty and also work family balance and toxic environments. So we're using that data to challenge some of the ways we're structured so that we can change how we operate. And then there's the educational programming. People, if you got a policy and you got procedures and responsibilities, people need to know. Our people who responded to our climate survey, many of them didn't know. We need to teach people or train them about acceptable and unacceptable behaviors, how to respond to them, the power of the peer, and I'm going to come back to that, and then skill building, building people's skill and critique and argumentation on dealing with dissent, on managing conflict and stress, because those are all things that have been associated with increased bullying on campus. Here's an example of prevention through skill building. And so when I was thinking about Virginia Tech and the work that they've done, this is from Michigan State University, their dean of the graduate school. Over several year period, they developed this program called Setting Expectations and Resolving Conflicts Between Faculty and Graduate Students, right? This is a preventative effort. And so getting clear early on what the expectations are and revisiting them periodically as that relationship changes and matures helps avoid a lot of the conflicts that we see with students. Now, in terms of department and group responding. Many of you occupy departments. We need to address the work environment, uh, the prolonged nature of a lot of these decisions, a hostile work environment. So more and more people get pulled in, more and more people choose sides, more and more people get affected. We need to develop and articulate shared norms. How is it we're going to operate here? So three things that I wanted to mention to you, the department communication protocol, talking a bit about bystanders, and uh, restorative interventions. Helping shared norms, communication protocol, in a nutshell, it's about having a group, let's say, for example, a department, faculty and staff talking together about how they want to work together. So it facilitates informal problem solving, provides guidelines for decision making. And it's what's, again, here's another example of a process intervention where the process of facilitating that discussion, and this came out of the work of a lot of ombuds offices, Maureen Brody from the University of California, San Francisco, Tom Seabach, University of California, Boulder, Larry Hoover is the one who first serviced at UC Davis, talking about the power of this particular tool um, in surfacing and having people agree to how they're gonna operate together. I wanna make a pitch for the power of the peer, particularly when we're talking about faculty. What we know is that our relationship to our colleagues and coworkers is critical for a good working environment. So for good or ill, our relationships with them matter. Faculty and staff behavior influence the institution, climate and culture. There is a lot written about and justifiably so about leadership and the influence on culture and climate. I also like to emphasize though, that faculty and staff can also influence the climate and culture. Frankly, there are more of us than there are of administrators. So yes, we have to hold leaders accountable. And I think we also need to embrace our own influence and do that in a constructive and proactive way. How we respond when somebody behaves inappropriately or poorly, they bully, communicates what the norms are. And for faculty in particular, I think this suggests faculty should really be taking each other on on this. We can't ask students to do that. We can't ask staff to do that. Um, and with administrators, we potentially can, but there's a built-in tension there that allows people to slip out from underneath taking responsibility, but it's harder to slip out when your peer takes you on. Here's some examples of bystander leadership work. The Florida International University has a really phenomenal program. And you're gonna hear more about this one from the University of Wisconsin-Madison around their policy on hostile and intimidating behavior. Vanderbilt University has used what they call a graduated intervention model. This started in their medical center. And it's based on the idea of using peer messengers. So fellow physicians to engage with another physician when they're engaging in inappropriate behavior. So the idea is that it progresses through the levels. So the informal cup of coffee conversation is a peer-to-peer -peer conversation. And Vanderbilt actually trained up a number of physicians to have these conversations with their colleagues. If 
that doesn't work, then it goes to the, what they call level one, the awareness intervention, which is that a pattern is starting to develop. So they try to get there before a pattern develops. When they see a behavior show up that's problematic, they start working with it then. And then if it develops into a pattern, then now more of the higher ups, the official organizational authorities come into place. Again, I'll give you the full reference for this. It's a fabulous one. On the horizon, restorative practices. Restorative practices have, um, a lot of universities have embraced those primarily in dealing with student conduct. We are seeing more starting to think about using restorative practices in other contexts on campus with faculty, staff, and other members of the community. Restorative justice is different than what we call the retributive justice approach, which is, okay, you did this stuff. We found that in fact, you did this stuff. And so now you get punished for it. You do, you do need discipline. There's no question. People have to have consequences for their actions. But one of the things we often miss out is the harm that has been done and the need to heal from that. So restorative practices, and one of my colleagues, Barbara Jones, is in the audience, and she knows a lot about restorative justice practices. So this can be part about making the victim whole again, but also about allowing, believe it or not, allowing an actor to take responsibility and accountability for their behavior, and also to recognize that this occurs in a community context where other people have been affected. And so the witnesses, the other people in the department, their experiences are really important too. And finally, I'll just finish up with this, the power of preventive work. Again, once bullying takes hold, damage is extensive. Most of what we can do when we can get it to stop is we have to do a lot of remediation for everybody. So we don't want to be in that place. So what do we do? We alter circumstances. So the talking about the structural rewards and how we do performance reviews, changing attitudes that are supportive of undesirable actions. This is something where I think faculty can take each other on. Because I have heard people say things like, you know, it's academic freedom for me to be able to slam my fist on the table because I'm passionate about that and that's academic freedom. Mm. I can take on my colleague on that and say, I appreciate academic freedom, but that isn't it. And if you wanna get your point across, here's some other ways you can do that, peer to peer. Institutional environmental practices, like I suggested with the department communication protocol, climate surveys that involve everybody and discussing those results. And the last point I wanna leave us with is, Building strong relationships a priori. It's one of the things I learned very early on, starting as a doctoral student, is I recognized that my work would always be in relationship to other people. Despite the fact that there's a norm of autonomy, we never operate in isolation of each other. And so, and the other thing is people tend to interpret your behavior. Remember I said behavior doesn't speak for itself. They interpret the behavior in the context of the relationship they have with you. And if the only relationship they've had with you has been maybe when you critique something they did, or you had a very strong reaction to something that happened and you took it out on somebody else. If that's all they've got to interpret your behavior, then it's not going to be pretty. But if we have gotten to know each other, we don't have to be best friends, you know, but if we've gotten to know each other, now you have a broader context. So if I do something and it's contrary to what you know me to our relationship to have been, how, I, how I've treated you in the past, you're more likely to stay open and to ask me the question, like what's going on? Right. So establishing strong a priori relationships builds a more cohesive community in which we can look at those behaviors that occur, talk about how they affect our ability to function, both as individuals, but also as a community and how to move forward from there. So thank you very much. And let me stop sharing my screen.